Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. The Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs has approved a substantial increase to the minimum support price for this year's Karif crops. The government expects this increase in MSP to benefit the agriculture sector, particularly the farmers who have been affected by the pandemic and the lockdown. This hike in MSP is in line with the commitment the government had made in its 2018-19 budget. In this budget, the government had committed itself to implement one of the key recommendations of the MS Swaminathan Committee. The MS Swaminathan Commission, also known as the National Commission on Farmers, had submitted a set of five reports between 2004 and 2006 in order to transform India's agriculture sector. One of the key recommendations made by the committee was to ensure that MSP is at least 150% or 1.5 times of the cost of production. That is basically cost of production plus 50%. This key recommendation which could increase farmers' income had not been implemented for a number of years. And finally, in the 2018-19 budget, the government had committed itself to implement this recommendation of the Swaminathan Commission. Finally, the government of India has taken a step towards upholding this commitment by announcing a substantial increase in this year's MSP for the Karif crops. The hike has been extended to paddy, oil seeds and a variety of pulses and the government expects that, at least in case of a few crops, the return to farmers would be more than 50% after the cost of production. In case of Bajra, Urad Dal, Tur Dal, Maize etc, the return to farmers is expected to be more than 50% over the cost of production. Whereas for the rest of the crops, the return to farmers is expected to be at least 50% above the cost of production. So this substantial hike in MSP is expected to help the farmers to overcome the impact of the pandemic and the lockdown. So in this context, let us have a more detailed discussion on the minimum support price policy of the government of India. See, minimum support price is basically a type of market intervention that is carried out by the government of India in order to protect farmers against any sharp decline in prices of certain select agricultural commodities. These prices are recommended by the Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices or CACP which is under the Ministry of Agriculture and the MSP recommendations of the CACP has to be accepted and approved by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. See, this pricing policy helps the government to achieve a number of objectives. The primary objective is to guarantee a fixed price to the farmer for the crops that they are cultivating. It basically sets a minimum support price and ensures farmers against any sharp decline in prices, especially in years when there is a bumper crop. Because when there is a bumper output of a particular crop, its supply in the market overshoots demand, leading to sharp decline in prices. So in such years, to protect farmers against price volatility, the government can guarantee a fixed minimum support price through the MSP. Next, the government can use MSP to promote the country's food security and crop diversification by using MSP as an incentive tool. Through MSP, the government can encourage farmers to cultivate the desired crops. For example, if the government anticipates a shortage of rice in the coming year, it can announce a higher MSP for the crop in order to encourage more farmers to cultivate rice. Let's say the government wants to cut down India's import dependency with regard to few crops such as pulses, oil seeds, etc. Then for these crops, the government can announce a higher MSP in order to encourage more farmers to cultivate these crops. The exact opposite can be done if the cultivation of few variety of crops has to be discouraged. So by using MSP as an incentive tool or as a disincentive tool, the government can ensure the country's food security and crop diversification. In fact, over the last four to five decades, such market intervention of fixing a minimum price by the government has helped India to achieve self-sufficiency, especially with regard to food grains. But the same policy has also led to shortages of pulses and oil seeds. Next, MSP helps the government to strengthen public procurement and public distribution. See, when the government announces the MSP ahead of the cropping season, it is basically sending out a message to the farmers. The government is basically assuring the farmers that irrespective of the market conditions, their crops would be procured at these minimum prices. 
and such procurement is done through government agencies such as the Food Corporation of India and they procure the crops from the farmers at these predetermined MSP prices and these procured crops are used for public distribution through the PDS system. It also helps the FCI to build up its buffer stock in order to ensure the country's food security. Overall, MSP helps the government to directly intervene in the market and stabilize the demand supply equation especially in years during which agricultural prices are volatile and guarantee a minimum price to the farmer. So like this, the MSP pricing policy helps the government to achieve multiple objectives. The government announces a minimum support price for a variety of crops including 7 types of cereals, 5 types of pulses, 8 types of oil seeds and as well as for raw cotton, raw jute, copra, dehusked coconut and Virginia flu cured tobacco. Apart from these crops, a separate support price known as fair and remunerative price is announced for sugarcane as per the sugarcane control order of 1966. See every year before the cropping season, that is before the Karif and Rabi season, the MSP prices are determined by the Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices. And these recommendations of CACP has to be approved by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. So the CACP determines the MSP based on a number of factors. These factors include the cost of production, the changes in the input prices, it tries to ensure parity between the input and the output price, it also monitors the trends in the market, it monitors the demand supply equation, it tries to ensure parity between the prices of different crops, it tries to evaluate the impact of support prices on industrial cost structure, on the cost of living, and on the general price level, that is inflation in the economy. And while calculating MSP, the CACP also takes into account the international price trends. It tries to ensure parity between prices paid and prices received by the farmers. And it also tries to take into account the impact of MSP on issue prices and subsidy. Over the years, the MSP policy has had its share of success and as well as drawbacks. First, let us talk about the benefits and the advantages that the minimum support pricing policy has brought in. First and foremost, the MSP policy has helped India to achieve self-sufficiency, especially with regard to food grains. From the era of facing massive food shortages in the 1960s and being dependent on imports from other countries, India was able to achieve self-sufficiency with regard to food grains in just a couple of decades because the government used MSP as a tool to promote the green revolution. MSP was used as an incentive tool in order to encourage farmers to adopt high yield variety seeds. So as a result, between 1960s and 1980s, India's agricultural output increased substantially and made India a grain surplus country and also helped India to achieve food security at the national level. So the overall increase in agricultural productivity especially that of food grains and cereals, can be partly attributed to the MSP policy. Next, since MSP is a market intervention tool, it has helped the government to stabilize food prices and balance the demand supply equation. It has also helped the government to increase the income of farmers and bring economic transformation, especially to those states which are well irrigated, such as Punjab, Haryana, Maharashtra, etc. But this also happens to be one of the drawbacks of MSP. Critics say that MSP has promoted regional disparity with regard to farmers' income. Various studies point out that only few states such as Punjab, Haryana, Maharashtra, etc. which are well irrigated were able to reap the maximum benefit of MSP leading to regional disparity and regional divide in other states. Then let us look at some of the other drawbacks of MSP. See the MSP policy was always biased towards cereals such as wheat and rice, especially in the initial years. This encouraged farmers to cultivate these crops excessively at the cost of other crops. Since MSP acts as an incentive tool, farmers were encouraged to cultivate more wheat and rice and the high MSP for these crops pushed farmers to divert agricultural land that was more suited for cultivating pulses for the cultivation of wheat and rice. So even though this policy helped India achieve food security, it ended up compromising India's nutritional security. Because this bias of MSP policy towards wheat and rice led to the neglect of nutritionally rich crops 
such as pulses and oil seeds. So this led to shortages in the production of pulses and oil seeds and it not only led to inflation in the prices of pulses and oil seeds but it also made India import dependent. The bias of the MSP policy towards wheat and rice has led to bumper production over the years and the Food Corporation of India and other government procurement agencies have been forced to procure these crops leading to a substantial increase in the public stock holding of cereals. As a result, the godowns and warehouses of FCI and other government procurement agencies are overflowing and they are unable to bear the huge logistical cost involved in storage and transportation. So this not only leads to massive amount of food wastage but it has also substantially increased the operational cost for the Food Corporation of India and other government procurement agencies. Then of course, the MSP policy increases the fiscal burden of subsidies on the government. Then finally, the biggest drawback of the MSP policy has to be the flawed methodology that the CACP has adopted to compute the cost of production. Because if the cost of production is flawed, then the MSP announced by the government would not bring any real benefit to the farmers. Because the recommendation of MSP by the CACP is directly dependent on its computation of the cost of production. And also, the failure of successive governments to completely implement the recommendations of the MS Swaminathan Commission has further diluted the impact of the MSP policy. Now let's take up an editorial that is trying to evaluate the impact of the lockdown on the country's formal labour force. See, just like the lockdown has affected the informal migrant workers, it has also affected the formal labour force as well, but in a very different manner. The slowdown in industrial and economic activities caused by the lockdown has led the industry and the government, particularly the state governments, to focus on labour laws. In order to revive industrial growth and economic activities, industry representatives have urged the governments to dilute labour laws in order to reduce their obligations even at the cost of affecting labour welfare. A few state governments have been more than willing to oblige to these demands of the industry and state governments such as Uttar Pradesh, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, etc. they have already proposed a dilution of their labour laws. These proposed dilutions are bound to affect the well-being of the labour class as it is going to have an impact on their working conditions such as salaries, facilities provided at the workplace, housing, social security benefits such as insurance, gratuity and PF and these measures could lead to the overall dilution of labour rights and labour welfare. But however, since the subject of labour is on the concurrent list under the 7th schedule of the Indian constitution, the jurisdiction is shared between the state governments and the central government. So the dilution of labour laws proposed by few state governments is yet to be approved by the centre and for the time being it appears that the centre is not looking to dilute the labour laws. In fact, even the International Labour Organization has stepped in and it has urged the central government to not allow labour laws to be diluted. So this in itself highlights the impact of the proposed changes in labour laws on the formal labour force. The central government on its part has even tried to provide some relief to the labour class through measures such as lower EPF contribution that was announced as a part of the economic stimulus package. Even though these measures of the central government are appreciable, the editorial says that these measures of the centre are very small and insignificant and they are not sufficient to protect the formal working class from the impact of the lockdown and the pandemic. So in this context, the editorial says that the centre needs to make use of its concurrent jurisdiction and push for wide sweeping reforms in the labour sector in order to strike a balance between the need to protect and uphold labour rights and labour welfare and the need to revive economic growth and industrial activities. See, there is no doubt that the government and the industry should do everything in their capacity to revive economic growth. But this need not necessarily come at the cost of labour rights and labour welfare. So striking a balance between these two objectives is very essential and hence the editorial is asking the centre to make use of its concurrent jurisdiction and review outdated laws such as the Interstate Migrant Workmen Act of 1979. This outdated legislation not only fails to protect the labour class, but it also places a burden on the industry. In fact, we had covered this topic in our analysis on the 22nd of April. We had seen how this legislation can increase the burden on the industry and inhibit industrial growth 
while failing to protect labor rights so the editorial says that by making use of its concurrent jurisdiction the central government can work with the states to push for broader reforms by thoroughly reviewing and updating the interstate migrant workmen act of 1979 the editorial is also asking the governments and the industry to promote hygiene and safety standards at the workplace in order to encourage workers to return to the workplace because workers are quite hesitant to return to the workplace due to the fear of the pandemic and it is the responsibility of the government and the industry to assure the workers about hygiene standards and about their safety in order to encourage their return to the workplace but instead we are noticing that the industry is trying to use coercive methods to push the workers to return to the workplace by asking state governments and the ministry of labor and employment to push workers to come back to work and it has also been pushing the ministry to allow legal action to be initiated against those workers who fail to turn up to work through relevant provisions of industrial labor laws the editorial says that instead of resorting to such coercive methods the industry and the government they need to jointly work together and inspire and motivate the workforce to return to the workplace for this to happen the industry needs to create the right kind of incentives and this includes a combination of hygiene and safety standards additional social security benefits and as well as monetary rewards in order to inspire and motivate the workforce apart from this the editorial is asking the governments to take a relook at other issues that are affecting the labor and the working class this includes the issue of unaffordable housing in urban and industrial areas and as well as the failure of the industry to provide for adequate social security benefits and maintain minimum wage standards now let's take up a column from page number 6 which evaluates new delhi's kashmir centric policies and its impact on the jammu region the column evaluates how the newly introduced domicile laws by the home ministry for jammu and kashmir is going to affect the political and economic aspirations of the jammu region see to understand this article first we need to understand the geography and demography of jnk see prior to the 5th of august 2019 that is before jnk was reorganized the erstwhile state of jammu and kashmir was made up of three regions this included the hindu dominated jammu region the muslim dominated kashmir region and the buddhist dominated ladakh region while the kashmir region is seen to be affected by separatism terrorism and insurgency new delhi has always seen jammu as a unifying force and it has set up jammu as a counter narrative or as a counter argument to the separatist tendencies in kashmir the writer says that this strategy of new delhi of always looking at jammu through the kashmir prism has affected its political and economic aspirations even though jammu represents a diverse population the central government the state government the political parties and various other organizations have projected jammu as a unifying force that symbolizes nationalism and patriotism even at the cost of polarizing the jammu society on religious lines new delhi in particular has always pushed this image of jammu as a counter narrative against the separatist tendencies seen in the kashmir region the writer says that these kashmir centric policies of the center has ended up weakening the political social and economic aspirations of the jammu region see when the state of jammu and kashmir was reorganized into the union territory of jnk and the union territory of ladakh the decision was initially welcomed by the jammu region but later people in jammu region felt let down because the status of jammu had been diluted to that of a union territory so new delhi's dilution of the political status of jammu and kashmir which was largely aimed at altering the status quo in the kashmir region ended up affecting the socio economic and developmental prospects of the jammu region as well upon this the center has partially restricted internet services in the jammu region as well on security grounds and hence people from the jammu region feel betrayed by the center because the restrictions on internet affects their economic aspirations now the new domicile rules that have been brought in by the ministry of home affairs which is largely aimed at completing the integration of the kashmir region with india ends up indirectly affecting the political social and economic aspirations of the jammu region see we have discussed the new domicile rules that were notified by the home ministry on the 2nd of april we had seen that these new domicile rules allows non jnk residents 
that is those who are not permanent residents of J&K to acquire property in J&K and to seek reservation in education and government employment. But the writer feels that since the Jammu region is more stable and more developed than the Kashmir region, the new domicile rules allowing outsiders to acquire property and seek reservation might end up affecting the Jammu region more than Kashmir. Since insurgency and separatism is more or less absent in the Jammu region, investors and businessmen would prefer to bring their investments into the Jammu region as compared to the troubled Kashmir region. So this has led the localites of the Jammu region to worry about their property rights. The new domicile rules allows anyone who has resided in Jammu and Kashmir for more than 15 years or anyone who has studied in JNK for more than 7 years to enjoy the domicile right. The new rules also pass on this benefit to the children of all central government employees who have served in JNK for a total of 10 years. So these extended domicile rights to outsiders of JNK has ended up threatening the educational opportunities and the job security of the natives of Jammu as well. Now let's take up another column from page number 6 which evaluates the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Africa. This column is mainly focused on analyzing the differences in India's approach and China's approach towards delivering humanitarian assistance to African countries. See, the WHO has already predicted that Africa would be significantly affected by the pandemic in the coming months. This is because most African countries have a very weak governance structure, their public health care systems are underdeveloped and inadequate, and most African countries suffer from acute shortage of essential items that are needed to fight the pandemic, such as ventilators, personal protection equipment, masks, essential drugs, trained healthcare professionals, etc. So this lack of domestic capacity of African countries is only going to increase its external dependency. This is where China and India come in, because traditionally, both India and China have been the largest providers of humanitarian assistance to African countries. The writers say that even though both China and India are playing the lead role in providing humanitarian assistance to Africa in the middle of the pandemic, there appears to be a stark difference in their approach which highlights their true intentions and objectives. But before we talk about the assistance that China and India are providing to African countries, first we need to understand how most African countries are organized politically and socially. See, in most African countries, there is a clear divide between the political elite and the common man. See, in most African countries, the political elite, comprising of politicians, political parties and the government, they are generally seen to be corrupt, dictatorial and autocratic, and as well as self-serving. In fact, this is what is responsible for the weak governance structure and weak healthcare systems in most African countries. But on the other hand, the common man in African countries is made to suffer the impact of poor socio-economic development. The difference between India's approach towards helping African countries and China's approach towards helping African countries is defined by this divide which exists within African polity and African society. See, China's approach is driven by its need to strengthen government-to-government -government relations. That is to strengthen the relationship between the Chinese government and the political elite of these African countries. So as a result, China's approach ends up excluding the genuine needs and demands of the common people of African countries. China relies upon its money power and its status as the largest trading partner of Africa and it seeks to provide donations of cash and equipment. It promises to make investments in massive infrastructure projects and such offers make China an attractive partner for the political elite of the African countries. But it fails to bring any immediate benefits to the common people. As a part of this strategy, China has donated essential medical equipment, masks, ventilators, personal protection equipment, and it has also provided for financial aid. And through its embassies, it is organizing cash donations from Chinese companies that are operating in African countries. The writers label this humanitarian assistance of China as donation diplomacy. According to the writers, the genuine intention of China's humanitarian assistance is not to bring relief to the common people of Africa, but instead to generate goodwill amongst African governments. The writers say that China is trying to achieve multiple objectives through its donation diplomacy. One, China is trying to shift the focus away from the Chinese origin of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
and two, it is trying to rebuild its image as a key provider of humanitarian assistance and it is trying to generate goodwill between the governments. But this donation diplomacy of China has also faced a backlash. Reports have come up from a number of recipient countries that the medical equipment that China is donating is of very poor quality. We have seen similar reports coming from European countries as well which receive donations from China. And China's image and China's soft power in Africa has taken a major hit. After Africans in China were targeted and stereotyped of being the carriers of the virus which had even led to violence against Africans in China. But China has managed to curtail this backlash through its political influence over African governments and through its money power which brings it closer to the political elite of African countries. In fact, this has always been the nature of China's humanitarian assistance especially towards Africa. Because the support of African countries is very crucial for China at multilateral platforms. See, recently China ensured that its candidates got elected as the head of food and agriculture organization and as well as the WHO and this was possible because of the support that African countries gave to China. So as you can see, China's humanitarian assistance is largely motivated by geopolitical factors and it has been designed to increase China's control and influence over African resources and strengthen its relationship with African governments and the political elite of African countries. But India's approach is very different from that of China and it is designed to not just strengthen government to government relations but also to build people to people relations by capitalizing on India's soft power in African countries. India's humanitarian assistance to Africa is also designed to build the capacity of African institutions. Since India is one of the leading producers of generic drugs, it has been labeled as the pharmacy of the world. The cheap and effective Indian generic drugs are very popular in Africa, especially because of its weak healthcare system. So since many years, African countries have come to depend heavily on India for the supply of generic drugs. So in order to help strengthen Africa's healthcare system during the pandemic, India has already dispatched huge loads of generic drugs, medical professionals and doctors and as well as medical equipment to a number of African countries. One such example was Mission Sagar, which was an operation led by the Indian Navy to provide humanitarian assistance to African countries located in the Indian Ocean region. Under this mission, India dispatched generic drugs and medical equipment to Mauritius, Seychelles, Comoros and Madagascar. Of course, India's assistance also has a geopolitical angle to it. But India does not look at building only government to government relations, but it is also focused on building people to people relations. It is focused on enhancing India's soft power in the African countries by strengthening the capacity of their institutions. The writers particularly appreciate the online version of ITEC that has been launched by the Ministry of External Affairs. See, ITEC stands for Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation. It is a flagship initiative of the MEA that provides for technical assistance, cooperation in the field of education, skill development, training and capacity building to small developing and underdeveloped countries. But now during the pandemic, the Ministry of External Affairs has launched the online version of ITEC in order to provide for online training and skill development and capacity building of African institutions. India is also trying to leverage its soft power and cultural power to further promote people to people relations which can help African countries in fighting against the pandemic. In countries such as Mauritius, where India enjoys a close cultural connection, it is promoting alternative systems of Indian medicine such as Ayurveda. Then Indian embassies, especially in East Africa, they are trying to work with Indian companies which have a long historical connection with African countries to arrange for donations. Indian embassies have also encouraged the cultural symbols of India such as Gurdwaras and temples to run community kitchens in order to provide for free food. So compared to the money and power driven approach of China, India's approach is more people centric and it is designed to achieve a diverse set of objectives including geopolitical objectives, India's national security interests, the need to promote friendly relations between the Indian government and African governments, the need to strengthen people to people and cultural relations and the need to build the capacities of grassroots institutions in Africa. Now let's take up an article from page number 11. A group of cyber security researchers have claimed to have detected a data breach on India's Beam app. According to these researchers, 
the design flaw in the beam application had potentially exposed the personal details of millions of Indians registered on the digital payments app to the risk of facing cyber fraud, cyber theft and cyber attacks. But these claims have been denied by the National Payment Corporation of India which has developed the BEAM application. The reports also indicate that the researchers initially notified NPCI which was the developer of the app but after NPCI failed to respond they approached the Indian Computer Emergency Response Team or CERT-N and following this the data breach was plugged by CERT-N. But these reports have been denied by the National Payments Corporation of India which continues to maintain that data on the BEAM app was not breached at any point of time. So this article mentions two institutions which can be very important for prelims. One is CERT-N and the other one is the National Payments Corporation of India. But we have covered both the institutions multiple times over the last few months. So I would request you to take this up as an exercise and read a little more about CERT-N and the National Payments Corporation of India. Now let's take up the practice questions for the day. Terms such as AAA, BAA2, BB, etc. which are frequently in news are related to a credit rating system that evaluates the credit risk of a prospective debtor. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 1, Moody's which happens to be one of the big three credit rating agencies apart from Standard & Poor & Fitch has downgraded India's credit rating. Moody's has downgraded India's credit rating from BAA2 to BAA3. This downgrade means that India is currently placed in the lowest investment grade according to Moody's credit rating system and it is just one place above the non-investment grade or the junk grade. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? Rajya Sabha members are elected by the method of indirect election. The electoral college for electing Rajya Sabha members consists of elected members of the legislative assembly of that state or union territory. They are elected in accordance with the system of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote. All the three statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 9, Rajya Sabha elections have been rescheduled to June 19th by the Election Commission of India. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? Article 372 deals with the name and territory of the union. The constitution recognizes two names for the union that is India and Bharat. India has been recognized as a union of states by the constitution. Amongst the given statements, the first statement is incorrect because it is article 1 which deals with the name and the territory of the union of India. This article recognizes two official names for the union that is India and Bharat. And it also recognizes India as an indestructible union formed by the coming together of different states. Hence, the correct answer is option D, 2 and 3 only. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 11, the Supreme Court has received a petition that is seeking the Supreme Court to recognize just one official name for the country that is either Bharat or India or the Republic of India. This is a reminder of a similar petition that was received by the Supreme Court in 2016 and this petition had been dismissed and the then Chief Justice of India had observed that every Indian had the right to choose between calling his country Bharat and India and the court cannot dictate these terms. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? The Bru tribe also known as the Riyang tribe is one of the scheduled tribes of Tripura. They were displaced from Mizoram due to ethnic clashes in 97. Recently, a quadripartite agreement was signed between the center, state governments of Tripura and Mizoram and the Bru Riyang representatives to facilitate the permanent settlement of Bru refugees in Tripura. All the three statements are correct. Option C is the right answer. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 11 which talks about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Bru refugee community in Tripura. Now let's take up the next practice question. Who is the chairman of the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs? The correct answer is option A, the Prime Minister. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 15, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs has approved the infusion of 50,000 crore rupees for MSMEs. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2015 prelims paper. Which one of the following issues the Global Economic Prospects report periodically? The correct answer is option D, the World Bank. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. 
the first question the minimum support price or msp for agricultural crops announced by the government serves multiple purposes discuss the second question the center's kashmir centric policies negatively affects the jammu region examine kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below so this concludes our discussion for the day thanks for watching